start the recording. And I'm also going to start the live transcript. Um, so uh, it's great to have everybody here. It's great to see some new people. Mickey, how are you? It's great to have you here. Um, happy to be here. Thanks for the invite, Kevin. Yeah. So, yeah, Kevin, thanks for inviting Mickey. Totally agreed. Um, You're very, right. very well. Right on. Um, all right, so a couple things. We have an agenda here, and um, a few things that we'd like to just take a look at today is one of the things um, that we're doing is uh, DEI event badging. And let me let me bring something up here really fast. Um, so on our So the badging that we do, one of the requests that has come on, so this is the, the number of um, events that have gone through the open review process. And for those of you that aren't familiar with this, you can take a look at the issue that is an open and transparent review process uh, for DEI event badging. Um, one of the things that we do is we list all of the events that we have badged over the years. And there was a request to make this information available, not just via the GitHub markdown page, but also potentially like as a, as a JSON that could be consumed programmatically. Um, so I don't know if people, I, you know, to me that seems like a very reasonable request. This is open and transparent information anyway, and just the way that we provide it in a couple different forms seems absolutely no problem. So the thought was we had a badging meeting earlier today, and the thought was uh, there's a, an event that we have when the badging process is over. So it's just typing, you know, for the, the coordinators, they just type a slash end and that kind of closes out the review process and awards the badge and uh, gets it assigned to this page here. But that process, the slash end could also, um, could also just write to, to a JSON file. So the, the request here is, let me wait for this thing to go away. The request here is that um, we could use some, some help, some volunteers, and Enoch has been the one that's been doing a lot of the badging work at the moment. So if you'd have an interest in helping Enoch uh, in this effort, just to kind of close out at that end of the review process and then make a JSON available for, uh, for use, that would be great. Um, and if not, <laughs> we'll just also just talk to to Enoch about kind of moving this forward. I think it's also on his, his map on things to do. So um, you can reach out to Enoch directly on, on Slack uh, or in any of these, these meetings. He's super available. So there you go. Any questions on that um, and kind of what, what we're trying to do there? Just take that list and provide it, provide it in a different form. All right. Um, the next thing, this came from Elizabeth. Uh, so I'll just kind of read it, but you can also read it. So just a, a newcom newcomer onboarding checklist. And um, what it feels like is, is providing this markdown file where people can um, kind of just have this in their repository, in their own repositories, um, and just, you know, just kind of set up, like, what, what have I done to help uh, or to, to join the chaos project? Um, and just kind of I think it's a nice idea just pointing people to a few things that they can do to help uh, lower those barriers to entry. So it sounds like this would be a, again, a file that like I would put in my own repository or Amy, you would put in your own repository uh, and just a, a checklist that you could track when, when you're a newcomer to, to the chaos project. Does, does everybody read that the same way that I did? I haven't had a chance to talk to Elizabeth about this. Does everybody kind of read that the same way that I do? Silence means yes or silence means no. I'm not sure which one. I'm not, I'm not reading it any differently. Okay. Um, do you have a reaction to this and like whether or not this is a good idea? Um, 
where it might be problematic, where it might be helpful. I'm curious what others have to think. Um, what well, do you think? Okay, sorry, go ahead, uh, Sean. No, I, I mean, I. But I Justin guess, has his hands up. Yeah, Justin, go. Yeah, the thing with the newcomers, uh, this might now suggest that there are people who have familiar with JIT. And if you see in some cases, I know it's common these days, but we should not just assume it for granted. Some people might not even know how to get clone or get, or, but they want to contribute. That's why they are coming to get acquaintance. Okay. Yeah, so might be uh, they can, I mean, we, are, we have a lot of programs, like what Ruth is organizing for the newcomers and things like that. People could identify, first of all, uh, if they're really like entry level into open source, if they've never used Git, then it's a good idea to always keep track for an actual onboarding. And that's what onboarding should be. They should start the first session with making sure everybody knows what, uh, where the repositories are, how to clone them. Okay. I think we have, yeah, we can just make a paper tutorial and put it to people's disposal. There are tons of those, uh, uh, I think even in GitHub, uh, in Git, uh, page where okay. people can now then when we have that we cannot assume at least they can have uh, the hands-on to create repositories and start doing this kind of hands-on work but okay. it's a good idea to me to to keep track of things that i mean it's a kind of discipline to keep them going and understand the activities around us okay thank you Armstrong. uh justin did you have a comment yeah, so I'm just wondering if GitHub would be maybe the right place for something like this kind of documentation, okay. just because if you think about, uh, there's two things that come to mind for me is like thinking of the audience of the kinds of people who will be on GitHub. There's many different ways that you can contribute to chaos and not all those ways that you contribute will be on GitHub. So it might be a, like a self-selected group of people who would see this, whether it's on the, maintain, the maintenance side or the, the newcomer side. Okay. Um, and then the other piece was, um, yeah, I'm just wondering if maybe the website would be a better, like somewhere that's a little more visible that um, would be helpful for both newcomers to get an idea of what might be expected of both of them or ways they can get onboarded into the community, but also for the, the main, like the maintainers or the active folks in the working groups to help um, uh, share that information and kind of help them follow those things when they're working with a newcomer as well. Okay. Uh, so the last was the last point, um, Justin, to maybe provide this document to folks like Elizabeth, and I know Ruth does a lot of onboarding, you know, new, uh, around the newcomer experience. So like to provide it to 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 folks like that. Was that the suggestion? Yeah, and there might be a way that we could generalize this across working groups as well, instead of having okay. to have every working group define their own guidelines, we could try to have a project wide um, guidelines, which might make it also easier to maintain on the website that we just have one set of guidelines to maintain instead of five or six for every different working group. Okay, thanks. Um, Kevin? Uh, I just wanted to uh, respond to that comment by saying we do, we do actually have space on the website or on the uh, newcomer participation page where uh, a document like that would work out perfectly. So we have two, we have two kind of content modules on that page that we're that we're trying to fill, and one of them kind of has content, and the other one does not. So okay, it's, a, it's where this would fit in pretty nicely. Is this this is on the redesign, Kevin, of the website? Yes. Yep. Yeah, on the the newcomer participation page, which is the uh, basically the uh, the knowledge base for newcomers. Okay, great. Yeah, that's a perfect place. Great, okay. So Armstrong, I'm gonna give you a plus one on that one. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, any other comments from people on this? Okay, so it sounds like the overall reaction is positive. It's just about how to present it uh, to the community. Great. Okay, cool. I'll share that with Elizabeth. All right. So
Um, we'll move on to our next item, which is the interview uh, campaign update. And Anita, you are here. Yeah. So um, I know you've talked about this a few times, but um, and I think, Nikki, I think you're kind of joining to help take a look at this as well, if I understood. Or you're joining in general. <laughs> you are always welcome. However, I understood that this was something that was talked about. Yes, I think that and um, the um, the all in issues number 24, both. Oh, OK, yeah. great. Fantastic. All right. Well, so then why don't we just start with the interview um, campaign update? I'll just, Anita, before I, I have you talk, I'll just tell everybody we are um, running the questions through the university IRB. So just from an ethics check. Um, so we're kind of still in the process of that. It's been submitted, it's under review. And um, for those of you that have been involved in university IRB processes, it can take a little while, not terribly long, but we're at a, we move to a university pace, which is a little bit different sometimes than a other, <laughs> than a not university pace. That's the best way I can say it, but it's moving What's forward. An IRB? Um, so it's a so it's a review board here at the university, uh, institutional review board that takes a look at, at how you're conducting research to ensure um, ethical considerations are attended to on the research. So for example, that you're uh, attaining, uh, obtaining consent when people are participating in, in the study that you have um, to ensure that you're properly handling the data once it's collected. So it's, it's really just a, an evaluation of, of a research process uh, to, ins to ensure that it's done well. Sean, do you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, it's entirely human subjects focused. So do no harm to humans is, is the principle and make sure that if you're asking them to participate, their, is their consent is informed. Um, and you know, if you follow that, I mean, it's really just a reasonable check on are you doing things appropriately? No, it makes total sense. I just didn't know what it stood for. Yeah, right on. Okay, um, so why don't, um, Anita, do you want me to start with any of these? I can click on any of these links that you would like. Yeah. Do you want me to just start at the top one? Yeah, just that with um, the top one. Okay. So uh, originally we had to look at the, um, the groups of um, categories of underrepresented people that we're going to be working on for this interview. Um, the primary aim is um, to measure how inclusive our metrics that we currently have are and um, how the underrepresented groups can relate to these metrics in reward circumstances. And we also want to like measure how this in, these uh, metrics have impacted their performance and participation in open source and um, according to their difference and their um, differences basically. So we want to use this as a means to improve on our D, diversity, equity, and inclusion metrics, and um, also like capture other um, metrics that we probably not heard of or are not aware of that people would also want to be included in the metrics that we're currently working on. So um, I think we can go to the next document now. Are there any questions on this document before I move on? No, okay. Okay, uh, I will move on. So here's the interview guide and questions. All right, Anita. Yeah, so um, I for the interview, we want to first of all get um, um, the data of people that have actually participated in open source and um, get their thoughts and then we'll streamline this, um, this data that we get down to a few individuals that we can have that are willing to tell us um, on a personal note how these DEI metrics affect them or have not affected them in any way. And um, so we've done the survey questions and this is the interview guide that we're going to be following to achieve these interview processes. And um, so far we've gone to the point where we're through with the survey questions and uh, currently 
awaiting the uh, IRB process. And that is how far we've gone with the, the survey plan so far. So Anita, did you have um, any questions or about, about your questions or thoughts that you would want any more feedback on? Well, yeah. Um, so if you also, these are the questions that we've come up with and um, we've reviewed it to the point that I didn't see any other suggestions. So I went ahead to curate, but if there are still any suggestions at this point, I'll definitely go back and update the, the survey form. So you can also go through this document if you have any um, other questions that you believe should be included in here or in the entire interview process at all. If there's any steps that were missed out that are really relevant to this um, survey as well. All right, thanks for all the work, um, Nikki. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you again for letting me join. Um, Y'all have done so much work. I'm super impressed by how much is here and how much thought has gone into it. Um, I have a couple of questions on like um, things that aren't included. So oftentimes when we talk about underrepresentation, we talk about class um, or socioeconomic status or whether, aka whether or not you're a person who has internet and computer at home. Um, and so I'm wondering if there is a reason that's not here. Um, and then, and, and, and related to that, like when, typically when we think about doing, when I've thought about doing surveys globally, I think about things like caste or other regional um, factors that will, that would meet, would make someone underrepresented. Um, I mean, I mostly work in the U.S. context, right? So um, this for me tracks with like a U.S. focused survey, um, which is totally fine. Um, but I noticed that on race too, like there's a difference for me between whether or not someone is black, which would make them uh, overrepresented in an African context or black American, which would make them underrepresented. Um, so I guess like just some questions about like where this is going um, and who's being included. Okay, well, mm -hmm. um, for, sorry. For the no, go ahead, Anita, okay. Okay, for the underrepresented groups, we basically decided to settle for the most, um, um, constantly um, highlighted underrepresented groups in the open source space because we didn't want to bring up um, groups that so many persons are not familiar with and because um, that might just be out, outside of what we are trying to achieve for the diversity and um, equity and inclusion metrics, which is why we highlighted these um, few ones here. Yeah, and I think in the case concern, it's really legit in, in a way that uh, we also reason broadly and in, in such a way, because if you see in the, one of the bullet points there, we included the indigenous people. That's a lot range of uh, social stratification system because underrepresentedness is a social construction. If we go in that space of uh, sociology or anthropology, then we become uh, a little bit divergent from the open source reality, which Anita pointed. So we are also guided with the literature, what people have studied in so many other uh, works to try to guide ourselves with the current state of the art. And that's one of the reasons we have the this thing passed through the review board and since people will now look at it in a different, from that, that expert tree form and the feedback they'll give us will integrate it to polish things out as it is always done based on our objective. But your point, Nick, it's very legit. I like that uh, way of thinking. Thank you. Nikki, do you have like a sample set of questions or ways of thinking around class and caste? that at least might be helpful just to locate? Yeah, I don't have around caste um, since yeah. I I am such an Americanist, but I do have stuff around class um, okay. and tying that, separating that from um, uh, how someone might label themselves as poor or working class or whatever, moving okay. to, I have internet access. I, I can do this work from home. Like those things that, um, 
are materially about access. And so mm -hmm. I can dig those up. That'd be great. And if you could either just drop them in the chat here or even just put them, I don't know if you're on this document, but you yeah. could also put them, just drop them in here as well. Okay. Just down in this list. That would be great. Um, okay. And then um, I, I had a, does anybody else have any questions for Anita? On this? Yeah. <laughs> just, I'm sorry, just one more. I know. No, I mean, no problem. Um, where is the appropriate place to add feedback about the questions themselves? I know that it's already with IRB, and so that's tricky. Um, so you, I think it would be okay just to add them uh, here or whichever one it was here. Just add them as comments or suggestions here. And IRB is not terribly picky if the nature of the survey isn't changing. So like they understand that a question might or an interview question might be added or removed, but as long as it doesn't fundamentally change things, they're that's okay. Yeah, that, I mean that that talks with my experience too. And so um so my my comments on the quant like on the survey link I'll just put here in group one. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yep, perfect. That'd be perfect. Uh Justin. Justin. Yeah. Justin. So, has a blog post. One thing that I was I was wondering is just knowing that we we do have that survey where we're asking a lot of these demographic questions already. And um I'm just trying to I'm just trying to make sure that we're not necessarily doing an overlap or duplicating efforts across the surveys or making sure that would it help that or how do we define like a clear outcome or goals that we want to achieve by doing this survey? So the uh, Justin's point is we we do have a current survey out um, right now, which is um, out really out to all chaos members about um, the community itself, kind of a, a reflection on how well we're doing with centering DEI really across the project as a whole. And this one, the work that that Anita is doing is is really trying to focus in on the DEI metrics that, that we have within the chaos project and understand how those metrics are are useful in, in the world. And so Justin, is your is your question about um, like the, the overlap of, of what we ask demographic wise between these two? Is that yeah, I, I guess it's just my concern is whether we are, we're collecting data that we necessarily have to collect, and especially thinking about how we're going to store that and share that. What I understood from the original proposal was it was really focused on understanding how people interpret the DEI metrics that we've created mm -hmm. and trying to understand ways that we might be missing some things in our metrics or ways that we okay. could improve our existing metrics. So I'm just wondering if we might be adding a layer of complexity with this data collection piece around people's identity, their demographic information, like may, maybe there's a useful tie in to connect those, the, the demographic data to the responses that people share about the metrics, but I'm, I'm wondering if that might add more complexity than we, we need to for this, for these I interviews. See. Okay, that's an interesting uh, concern. Yeah, we are adding this complexity because we don't just want to be very specific. We want something that we could build a, a kind of generalized view in open source. You see, since chaos by nature, it's on uh, analyzing the health and the analytics of open source projects. So if we have a view, and you know, qualitative studies has strength to answer certain sort of questions, but they are limited in in the sense that they suffer from generalization. So the more data we have with this complexity, then we have some kind of representativeness and we want to stretch also this, uh, this work so we could have empirical evidence in this uh, topic that is also uh, not well covered. There are a lot of, of, of uh, things that uh, are going on right now. People are still asking a lot of questions and there, is, there are very few works any kind of uh, concrete evidence on, on, on that representedness. So we want to stretch out that, that borders to see how far we can go and most hopefully trying a kind of peer review uh, paper out of this. 
I don't know if that answers your concern. I guess I'm, I'm just trying to understand if that's what we're trying to do with our existing demographic survey that we have launched now, or if we want to fold that piece into this survey as well around the data collection piece. Because I'm also wondering now is that, well, I think we have to consider who has access to this kind of data. If we're going to collect this very personal information, um, yeah. and how that would impact so, how we're working with the responses around, say, just the DEI metrics. So um, from the way that my IRB would work is it typically works is as the like I would be or somebody and like Matt would be the person who quote unquote collects the data. And then for analysis, we would be responsible for de-identifying it if people outside of our organization access it. So the IRB also makes us responsible for the management of the data in a way that protects people. Yeah, and I think uh, from what Sophia, Elizabeth, and many others have contributed in the past, we will apply double blind. So only one person like Elizabeth will have the original script, then they'll try to uh, apply double blind on each participant. So during analysis, you just be seeing like example, P1, T1, M1, you don't know who that person is. And some sensitive information that can uncover a particular acronym P1, we have to mask it as well because people can still build, uh, they can read within the text and then uh, try to map the real person from that text. So those kind of sensitive comments don't, right. don't mask it, yeah. The way that, um, so the way we had it, I uh, analyzed some survey data from the Linux Foundation from summer 2021. And even with like 2,500 responses, we still didn't have enough data of people who were not white male to, to protect all of their identities. So we ended up blending groups together so that we could talk about uh, underrepresented groups, but in a way that didn't identify specific people in very small underrepresented groups. And there are a lot of statistical challenges associated with making sure you have a, a, a I guess, a, proof, what is it, a, a provable, hypothesis that um, the question is actually telling you what you think it is about underrepresented groups because so much of our data, our data, our data will be overwhelmingly white male. <clears throat> and then I guess if, if we're, if we're confident that we do want to collect this data about the, around these interviews, which as I understand are mostly around our metrics and kind of the experience of contributing to chaos, then I might suggest we put the questions about identity after so that way once someone especially this is like a conversational format as well because I, I don't know if it's just going to be the survey or if there will also be conversational interviews then maybe we put those questions at the end after someone has answered so then they have a more of a clear mind of how they want to identify themselves with in mind of how they responded to the questions maybe there's things they might not feel comfortable sharing or having uh, recorded if they answered a question really honestly or candidly um, so if we're confident that we want to keep keep these questions in with the, the metrics pieces, then I would just suggest that we move them after the others. Yes, and I think that is the original plan. I think Anita is aware of that, and she has taken that into consideration too. Because we discussed this in one of the, if you read the doc, we mentioned that somewhere. Because you can start with a very sensitive question, and somebody becomes uncomfortable, and that's the end of it. And since it's open-ended, most of the things will emerge from what they are saying. You, you drive it at the end, you, you, the person doing the interview, so he tries to read within the line. If the person becomes very freely, might be they themselves will say something that will lead to those kind of identity questions that, I mean, it's very good to put it at the end. I agree with you that, yeah. So the the purpose yeah. the purpose of the uh, this overall survey is to kind of member check our met our current DEI metrics. Did I hear that right? Is that accurate? Well, well, the, well uh, I, okay, Anita, go ahead, please. The purpose is to we don't want to capture the the DEI metrics for people in chaos, but then people outside chaos that are also. Um, that can also 
um, be impacted or affected by our metrics because um, chaos metrics are not just for the chaos community, but the entire open source at large. So these DEI metrics are for every other person in an open source community that might have um, come across a particular situation that our metrics either helped or uh, a metric would actually have helped to tackle that particular scenario or that particular situation. Okay, so basically, you want to uh, you want to take the the metrics that DEI has has already uh, kind of defined, and you want to present them to uh, people outside of our community and and ask them what they think about them. Yes, more like that. Okay, and then regarding the uh, so the uh, how are we, how how do we plan to present this information? Uh, back to chaos. Uh, so I, I would assume that the goal would be to kind of add some validity to our metrics and maybe look for uh, uh, possible places where we need to change. Would that be accurate? Yes. Um, so when we get all of this, we are going to go over the data and um, um, review it and then get back the feedback from the participants, I, from the one-on-one -on -one calls especially, that's the one we're going to be focusing our attention on. So we're going to create that into um, the report and then bring it back to the chaos community um, where we review these um, outcomes of the survey. Okay. Uh, thank you. This is a, a really great conversation. Um, Anita and Armstrong, I hope this is helpful. You know, every time we have a conversation. It's yeah. Helpful. Yeah. I mean, from the multiple uh, perspectives that people are looking at things, it's very helpful and it's an inclusive study as well for, from, from what Anita has, uh, has been doing you know, and the feedbacks we are gathering, it's shaping the way, you know, uh, we will collect more inputs and then analyze it as well. And I think many more people have shown interest also in the analysis uh, phase. Great. Okay. Well, uh, as always, thank you for, for this work. And I think we're really getting close to, to starting to talk to people. So that's great. Um, I'm gonna, does anybody else have any other comments on, on this? I'll just move to the last item as we're getting close on time. A few things in the chat. Um, yep, I think there's general agreement about that move to the end and a great work from Justin. So great work. All right. So as far as new metrics go, so um, there are a couple of new metrics that we are um, working on within the the DEI working group, and I'll, I'll just bring this up. Um, it's these two right here. So defining how we think about newcomer experience as well as recognizing uh, contributions. So these are currently I'm, I'm we worked on them. It was a couple of weeks ago as a group, and I think I have enough feedback, kind of like what we just did with the survey. You know what I mean? So like we collected feedback on these. Um, I think they're good to go. So one of them is now in a PR. I'm, basically, I'm just following the process to get them released for community review. That's all I really needed to say. So if you want to take a look at, at these metrics in more detail or provide feedback on them, I'll have the issues open really, really soon. One issue is already open. Um, so you can take a look here. And so this is you know, about the creation of a, of a new metric called newcomer experience. Feel free to take a look. Um, like I said, I just have a few little little things that I have to do to kind of wrap this up and get it out for full community review, but I plan to have that done in the next couple of days. Um, and these metrics are related to, um, to our efforts to, to consider DEI uh, Project DEI recognition, badging may not be the right word here, 
Um, so as we as we have had a lot of success with event badging, which I'm happy to call badging, you know, we're we're kind of doing that in an open and transparent process. As we know, projects create a whole another issue of scale that events do not create. Um, they also create a whole another issue of time boundedness that events do not have as well, because if an event occurs over two years, we ask them to go through the review process two different times. Yeah. So there are just a whole lot of things that we're thinking about um, with respect to, to project recognition. And I just, a couple of weeks ago too, we had done a bit of a, uh, you know, a kind of a think out loud process and that's down in here. So, you know, what are we trying to accomplish? You can just scroll down in the minutes, but what are we trying to accomplish with, with such a program? What would be the future goals of a program? And what would you think, in this case, we just called it a badge, but it might just be recognition. What do we think that such a recognition would, would signal? Um, so we've had this open and, and there's a, we're starting to have this conversation in all in. So you can click on that as well. And particularly it's, my responses are in response to, to this kind of, this badging initiative, the all in chaos badging initiative. And all, of, all that I did was I just captured what I just showed you in our minutes and put it here in the issue, just so we could start bringing the conversation um, together. So um, this is still very much in progress because we are balancing, you know, part automation, part a suggestion to include a DEI.md file in repositories that are uh, that would like to signal their efforts in centering DEI in the projects that they do. Um, we're balancing that against the kind of an inability to do peer review because that's not something we can do at scale. So they're just, they're kind of a lot of moving pieces here. Um, and so our, our focus is at least as we move forward with this program is to, to do it right. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know if people have comments. I just, I, I guess the point here is that we're continuing to talk with uh, Demetrius, we're continuing to talk with the All In project and folks at GitHub as to how we can think about this project as being meaningful uh, for communities that would like to, to signal their efforts uh, around DEI and centering DEI and the work that they do. So I'll just stop there and see if anybody has comments. Yes, Nikki. <laughs> of course, I have comments. That's great. Oh, thank you. Because we're really trying to do this right, you know? Yeah, I mean, like, I don't, uh, I haven't, I first heard about the GitHub, sorry, my, I've got dogs in the background. I That's first heard okay. about GitHub's um, initiatives, you know, at the conference. And and so I don't, I don't imagine that chaos has the ability to tell GitHub not to do this. And so for me, it feels like an approach of harm reduction um, rather than, you know, because I, one of the things that came up in conversation around this, um, you know, I think with Kevin at the conference was that what this allows projects to do is signal safety and signal wokeness mm -hmm. and sort of bring people in and then behave differently, right? Um, and so it's like, how can we help projects um, my dog is also very upset about this. How can we help projects <laughs> um, move towards these sorts of recognitions without like, for lack of a better word, sort of tricking people into thinking that the community is Agreed. safe. Agreed, yep. You know, um, because if I go into a project and I don't know anybody and I see a DEI page that's got words that, that I hear in queer trans communities, I'm gonna think that there are queer and trans people there. Gotcha. Uh, only to maybe be bamboozled and find yep. that those people aren't there. Um, and that I'm the only one of, of X demographic. And so, yeah, so for me, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm always glad the DEI is being talked about and I'm like, how can we make this as harm, harmless as possible? Yep. Um, so no, I, I hear you. Um, so I, like, I, I think the, the hope behind something like this is to, to help projects think about how to center DEI in the work that they're doing. So if we're asking them to talk about how they attend to newcomer experience or how they attend to recognizing, whatever it might be, um, we're trying to, to, to ask projects to think about these things and articulate them. 
um, for their community, which is a positive thing, um, I think. It, at least just like you need to think about, <laughs> you need to tell us what you're what you're doing. Um, but that doesn't remove what you're talking about as well. So it's this it's this balance of like we're trying to help projects be better at centering DEI in the work that they're doing. But it's so I, I'm not sure where that um, where that overlap is between helping projects be better at, at, at this without causing harm, as as you're talking about. I, I don't know where where that where those overlap with one another, and it's it's just not clear to me sometimes. And that's when we're talking about trying to do this right. It's it's trying to find that spot where we are helping projects. We, we really are, we're getting projects to think about, about centering DEI in ways that they really haven't thought about it before. Um, yeah. But at the same time, not, not causing harm. So I don't know, I don't have a good answer for you. Matt, I think I, I okay, somebody's talking. Uh, I was just gonna say that I don't think that we're, that no. there is people that necessarily try to indicate that there are certain populations in the project. I think this is more of a, here is what we're doing in order to make this more welcoming. And it was given in so that if somebody says, I'm joining and I am part of one of these communities, then they can give input. And then a conversation can start about how they can make it more inclusive or what needs to be done. So this is just a welcome page that says, we would really like to be able to do this and we're trying, but nobody is there until they get into it. So, Yeah, for sure. I think, I think one of the things that, um, like I, I, that point is well taken Katie. And one of the things that I think I'm trying to communicate is that when you're part of a marginalized community, there are certain words that, that are in community that often get appropriated. And so that signal presence, right? I certainly don't assume that because a community has certain language that certain people are present, but it signals to me that that someone with in-group knowledge participated in the in the creation of that, right? Um, and so it signals, it, I'm not saying it explicitly communicates, but it, it tacitly signals a sort of like safety or welcoming that might not be present when something is templated and rolled out like GitHub wide in this way. And so, right, so it's, it's just about harm reduction. Yeah, I think in a way, when we are looking into data, because this happens a lot in information uh, cycle, there is a difference when you are treating data and when you are treating a person, you treat them different. And when we have metrics, if those metrics have good representation, now those informations that comes out like uh, at like some uh, form of, uh, can I say, finding or the outcomes, they are a kind of facts that we obtain from this, from those data without necessarily throwing our individual biases. It's not like chaos is saying to get up, what you are doing is right, it's wrong. We are saying that the data suggests we could improve these things. And we are, ourselves as a community, we don't have a product with a brand name that we are selling, we are to, about analyzing. And that is the main reason that I sometimes suggest we look into data uh, sets from different organizations. For example, OpenStack data, uh, the, the, the TensorFlow data, many other organizations, so that our analysis should be holistic and be complete in that aspect of making some kind of analytics. Now, it's true that Correlation is not causation, and we admit that in most of our filing. So we are only suggesting some ways of how people could use our metrics, adapt it in their context mm -hmm. to make some findings. And if you look into GitHub, I think uh, this year, early this year, a couple of works were performed by some uh, early researchers. I think some PhD students saw the, the work. And GitHub itself acknowledge and thank, and I think they even remunerate her financially for that work that she published. 
It's something that was going on in their community and nobody ever spoke up, but she brought it empirical evidence. And when those data are there, they speak for themselves without necessarily being imposing in our own biases. So I, I do have to, to stop this conversation only because we're at, at time. Um, these are all <laughs> really points really well taken. Um, so if you, if you need to drop, no, I totally understand. Nikki, if you could hold on to, I have like a follow-up question that I just would really like to ask again. So I just want to let people know that, that I'm going to stop the recording. You know what I mean? Like this meeting is, is over and, um, it was great to have everybody here. And if you gotta go, you, you gotta go. So I'm going to stop the recording.